Today we'll deal with this question of echo chambers and filter bubbles, which is a topic that I've done quite a bit of work on over the last few years. Um, and I've mentioned a little bit about that already, um, I guess, at the end of last week's lecture, if you remember, um, as we sort of talk more broadly about the sort of concepts of uh, um, the public sphere um, as it exists uh, now in this uh, highly online mediatized environment. Um, so uh, for this week, obviously, we are kind of continuing that kind of debate. We talked about the, di the digital public sphere, what it looks like, what the, cons what the, the various components are that, um, that it's constructed from. Today, th today, then, really, the question becomes, well, if the networked public sphere or public spheres, if, if the network of publics, I guess, that we exist in now is... Uh, divided into these different publics, groupings, communities, and so on, does that lead to fragmentation? Does it lead, in fact, to a form of fragmentation where people are isolated from one another in different spaces um, to an extent where they no longer see the same information, the same uh, news, where they essentially live in different realities, and where perhaps by living in these different realities um, they are no longer able to function as a society to make informed decisions, for instance, when it comes to elections, when it comes to voting, when it comes to referenda and all these things, um, because they're simply in echo chambers or filter bubbles. So that's the, the theme of today. And then next week, we'll continue that discussion a little bit further with a particular focus on the role of the platforms, the platform providers, the large multinational, multi-billion dollar companies that are providing so much of the infrastructure for the network public sphere these days, of course. Um, and that's probably also a good time to talk about that, given everything that's going on with Twitter at the moment, since Elon Musk has taken over, but also given every, everything that's been going on for some years now on the Facebook or the what is now meta side, I guess, of things. Um, and of course, there are plenty of other very powerful platforms as well that um, have uh, a lot of control over this media ecosystem, I guess, that we're dealing with. So that's, that's what's coming next week. Um, and both this week and next week really extend further on the textbook itself that I've given you. So today, of course, I've given you a reading uh, of an article of mine that in itself is actually kind of a condensed version of uh, a book that I published a few years ago uh, called Are Filter Bubbles Real? And that's that book uh, and what it looks like. Um, so a lot of what I'm talking about here is essentially a condensed version of the argument that's in that book, uh, and the article I've given you, again, is also in itself a condensed version of that argument. Um, so let's go through this whole question of echo chambers and filter bubbles and have a, have a bit of a chat about what, what exactly is going on there. Why do we think that these things exist? Why do people think that these things exist, I should say? Um, why is this a concern? What's the big deal about echo chambers and filter bubbles, basically? Um, and is there actually any evidence that they do exist as well? So starting with the concerns, it's interesting the sorts of people that you end up citing in these kinds of articles and, and books. Um, but it's also really a clear indication of just how far this idea of echo chambers or filter bubbles has gone when even a US president, Barack Obama, in his final farewell speech as president in 2017, talks quite prominently about this idea of filter bubbles. That's a sign that that concept has very much arrived, that it's very much in people's minds, that it is not just something that we talk about perhaps in, in academic circles, but it has become very much a widespread concept that ordinary people, but also, of course, extraordinary people like US presidents talk about. Um, so what he said in that address was that it seems to him that for many of us it's become safer to retreat into our own bubbles. And he said, well, that might be in our neighborhoods, on our college campuses, on our places of worship, or especially our social media feeds, um, surrounded by people who look like us, who share the same political outlook and never challenge our assumptions. It's in some ways the kind of the filter bubble argument in a nutshell. So basically saying particularly through the emergence of social media, through the use of social media, that 
this kind of sorts us into different groups, different communities where we're not challenged anymore by other points of view, where Republicans are gathering with Republicans, Democrats are gathering with Republicans. In his uh, kind of context in the US, uh, where basically you only have like-minded people around you, and therefore you might really see a very different reality, a very different understanding of reality from people down the road who are in, in other filter bubbles. That's the sort of logic, essentially, that this ultimately is, is uh, representing. And yeah, the fact that someone like Barack Obama you know, finds it necessary to talk about that in the farewell speech shows how much of a concern this has become. It's actually, in a sense, similar to many decades before when at, at the end of or after the end of the, the Second World War, um, President Eisenhower made that famous speech talking about the military-industrial complex, you know, saying that there is something brewing in the US where the military is becoming so powerful and the industries around the military are becoming so powerful, and that's a concern. That was the big concern for him. For Barack Obama, one of the big concerns, obviously, at the end of the 2010s is echo chambers, filter bubbles, the power of social media to sort us into these different bubbles. So that's, that's kind of the context, I guess, in which we're operating here. Um, and of course, that's not gone away simply because Barack Obama's gone away. If anything, that concern has become even bigger over the years of the Trump presidency and everything else that's been going on. Um, now, stepping back a little bit from that, it wasn't always like this. Um, a lot of these sorts of ideas started really much earlier. Um, so in, in the mid-90s, really at the start, that, at the point that the web really first became a mass medium, if you like, um, we saw authors being quite enthusiastic at, at first about the potential of all of this. Um, so Nicholas Negroponte wrote a book called Being Digital and talked within that about the idea of the daily me, which he said was basically like a a personalized newspaper that, uh, that you would be able to access online, not so much as a newspaper, as a print newspaper, but essentially that would replace the sort of traditional forms of news media and be personalized to your interests. So if you don't like sport, you don't get sport. If you don't like politics, you don't get politics. You'd get the stuff that you're actually interested in. That's sort of the logic, basically, in all of this. And um, you know, at that point he was basically saying, well, that's a great thing because it means that people are getting what they want. They don't have to wade through stuff that they're not interested in. They don't have to pay for stuff that they're not interested in. Um, they're actually getting the news that they're genuinely interested in. And so for, for a lot of people, that's a, that's a benefit basically rather than a problem. Um, so um, back then that was really seen as, well, yeah, great. Okay, that's an, that's an advance and that's an improvement to what we've got today you know, traditional newspapers, traditional TV news, that's basically just one size fits all generic news coverage, but not really for anyone in particular. Um, so that was sort of the early days of the web saying, well, this is great. Yeah, it, it will improve things. It, it, it will make things easier for a lot of people. Um, but very quickly after that, from the early 2000s onwards, the mood really changed. And we've got people like Cass Sunstein, who really introduced the idea of echo chambers uh, fully. Um, who, who wrote then and has been writing for the decades to come about the problems with all of that. The problem really being in his view that once you are getting this kind of personalized view of the world, then that puts you into an echo chamber where you see the same as other people who've got your own worldviews perhaps might be seeing, but the rest of society gets very different kinds of points of view. And that means that we no longer have the same reality, the same view of rea reality, ultimately. And of course, again, the idea with that is that once that happens, we might make our decisions about society, about democracy, about who to vote for, about who, who to engage with, on the basis of very different bits of information, very different, um, a very different balance of, of information, basically. So that might be, again, in voting decisions, in democratic participation, it might be in more everyday decisions uh, as well, let's say, about whether or not climate change is real, and then some people might do something about it, some pe people might not, and so on. And um, of course, those concerns have continued as well over the past decades. So Sunstein's almost built a bit of a, um, a, a cottage industry. He's published books called Republic, Republic 2.0, hashtag Republic over the years, that basically are adjusting this idea of echo chambers to the emerging technological, the emerging communicative environment from 
the early web to more recent forms of social media and so on, of course, as we've gone from there. Um, a little bit later, Eli Pariser came along and introduced this idea of filter bubbles. Um, that at the time in the, mid, uh, uh, in the early 2010s was essentially more focused around the social media recommendations or the, not the social media, the search recommendations that search engines make, for instance. So if you're Googling for something, do you get the same results as the person next to you? And he actually starts his book on filter bubbles from that point by saying, well, I asked two people to Google the same thing. They got different information, so they must be in different filter bubbles. And again, that, if that's true, then that's a concern. If you can't be sure that the information that you're seeing when you're searching for some really important topic is the same information that everyone else is seeing when they're searching for that important topic, then we've, we do have a problem, of course. So these are the kind of concerns that they articul articulated. And of course, and sorry, maybe a trigger warning there, but of course the, the final sort of end point that people are seeing is that sort of stuff, you know, where you have people who have become so deeply embedded in the QAnon conspiracy theory that they actually start an armed insurrection, an armed coup at the seat of power in the United States. So these people, yes, could be said possibly to be in an, in an echo chamber or a filter bubble or whatever um, if they really genuinely believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump, that there's some, some grand kind of conspiracy going on in the world. Um, uh, and if they have no longer, if they no longer have any kind of understanding of what everyone else is thinking, or, or, or of of the understanding of the world that everyone else has, then the argument here is that yes, they live in a filter bubble in an echo chamber, and they're kind of detached from um, everyone else's reality, basically, and that's why they do what they did. Um, so that's the kind of the extreme. This is another example. This is from a bit over a year ago, when. Um, a, a survey in the US basically found that more than half of Republicans still thought Trump was the real president, the election had been stolen or it was illegal or whatever. Um, so that's again basically saying, well, half of US Republicans at that point seemed to have a very different reality from everyone else in the country, basically. Um, so is that because of echo chambers or filter bubble? Is that because they've, they're simply getting a very different feed of information, feed of news from the rest of the world. And therefore, they have a very different reality that they've constructed for themselves. That's the concern, really. And it is a, really, a real concern, obviously, given, given these kinds of surveys, given, given what we've been seeing in the US and elsewhere um, for the last few years, of course. But is it as simple as that? Can we simply say that, well, social media came along, social media algorithms came along, search, of course, came along, and search algorithms came along. So is it as easy as that? And can we really say, well, yes, they've put us into echo chambers, into filter bubbles? And by the way, that's Eli Pariser, of course, uh, who introduced the idea of, of filter bubbles. Is, it really, is that really going on? There's a few questions that we need to ask here to begin with. Um, what do these terms really mean? How would we identify an echo chamber or a filter bubble if we saw it? Um, what needs to happen for there to be an echo chamber or a filter bubble? Um, and that starts with where would we look for them? Where would we find them? Um, as I say, with filter bubbles, Parisa starts by talking about search. So search engines, general search engines, perhaps. Maybe more specifically, search engines where people search for news topics, so Google News rather than just Google. So news portals, perhaps, news recommender systems, possibly, maybe even on news websites as well, um, the sort of stuff that gets recommended to you. More recently, the debate has shifted more towards social media. Um, so rather than just saying, as some people said early on, it's the web itself that's the problem, or it's search engines that's the problem, maybe it's social media that are the problem. But there, too, we need to ask further questions, because social media as you've now seen for the last few weeks as well, it's not, it's not just one thing, um, but there are many different aspects and affordances of social media, of course, as well. So where on social media would we expect to find echo chambers and filter bubbles? Around our own personal profiles, because of who we connect with, who we interact with. Um, on pages, let's say, on Facebook, uh, where perhaps you, you join in order to be 
connected with people who have similar interests and similar ideas as you uh, on hashtags, let's say on Twitter or maybe groups on Facebook where again you might participate or others might participate because they represent a particular point of view or some particular interest or whatever. So where, what are the specific spaces on social media that we actually should be looking at with all of this? Um, not just say that social media overall are the problem. Then there's the question really about what exactly are we looking for? Let's say we're looking at a particular space on social media, but what, what are the conditions for there to be an echo chamber or filter bubble? Um, in the strongest definition, you really need to be disconnected from the rest of the world and just connected to people who have the same points of view. So maybe in, in the sort of QAnon case, all you, if, if all you see is, uh, is QAnon information, then yes, perhaps that disconnects you from reality. But if you're still connected to other sources of information, can that actually produce the sort of negative effects that we're talking about? So do you need to be hermetically sealed off from the rest of the world and only getting a particular type of information? Or is it enough to be just more mildly kind of disconnected or preferentially connected to other people who have the same sort of hyper-partisan ideas as you do? So is it just enough to see just a lot more QAnon stuff than everything else in order to be in an echo chamber or a filter bubble? Or in fact, in the weakest definition, is it enough to just be kind of within a partisan community um, you know, where you, where you just interact a bit more with people who've got the same worldviews as you do, but you're not really disconnected from the rest of society. Um, in that case, isn't every political grouping, every political party, an echo chamber or a filter bubble? And that probably goes too far, because then, you know, every kind of community of interest would also be an echo chamber or a filter bubble. So once we get to that point, do any of these terms make sense anymore? And are they going to have the negative impacts that people like Pariso and Sunstein talk about. Because if, if every community of interest is an echo chamber or filter bubble, well, but then we've had them for as long as humanity has existed, basically. Um, so what, if anything, has changed in recent years um, to make things worse? And that's partly also the question of, well, why are we talking about these things now? Why are we saying they exist now, perhaps more than they have existed in the past? Is it because there's something more fundamentally happening in society, that society is getting more polarized? People are getting more polarized against each other, perhaps, uh, on ideological lines or economic lines or identity lines or whatever else, basically? Um, is it because we are being put into these different communities by the algorithms of the platforms we're now using? So is it the algorithms that kind of read out certain signals about us, about our identities? and are putting us into these different spaces, this, these different publics? Or is it some sort of feedback loop between the two of them as well, where we join certain communities, the algorithms read, read that out, and then put us more and more into these communities and disconnect us more and more from whatever else is going on? Um, so that needs to be understood as well, if that's what's going on. And then finally, this really comes back ultimately to definitions of echo chambers and filter bubbles as well. Um, Part of the problem with a lot of the early work on echo chambers and filter bubbles, including Sunstein and Parisa, has been that a lot of the descriptions are based on anecdote, based on sort of common sense where people are saying, yes, everyone knows we're getting more and more divided as a society, as a nation, um, so there must be echo chambers and filter bubbles. Again, as I've said, Parisa quite literally says, I asked two people to Google for, different thi for the same thing and they found different results so they must be in different filter bubbles. That's not really much of an empirical basis to build any of this on, unfortunately. Um, and empirical evidence for them, as you'll see in a minute, is much harder to come by. So the problem here is we don't actually, we still need a lot more research, particularly from media and communication scholars, into how information really travels, what information people really access, whether or not they're really as disconnected uh, or connected uh, from and to uh, information sources as this thesis of echo chambers and filter bubbles says there. Um, part of the problem here is also, frankly, um, that the people who've been most actively promoting these concepts are not, in fact, media and communication scholars. Uh, Sunstein is a legal scholar. Um, 
nothing wrong with that, but um, certainly not an expert in understanding communication flows online, understanding how people connect with each other and so on. Parisa calls himself an activist and tech entrepreneur. So they don't necessarily have the, the scholarly knowledge, the, the, the domain knowledge, the field knowledge to actually undertake empirical research that proves or disproves echo chambers or filter bubbles in their existence. So there are quite a few problems with these terms. Um, most centrally, really, that sort of uncertainty about how to even define them. And that's really partly because of the work of, of people like Sunstein and Parisa, who don't really bother to define them very clearly. Um, that's also then moved into more broadly, way, uh, more, more broadly mainstream discourse, of course, again, all the way through to Barack Obama's final speech. Um, we use, and if you look at particularly mainstream media, uh, they use these terms very, very vaguely most of the time, often, in fact, interchangeably. Um, there's even quite a few uh, research articles that talk about echo chambers, a.k.a. filter bubbles, that basically say they're, they're the same thing, in which case, well, why do we need both terms, obviously, if, if, if they're just exactly the same thing? If they're not the same thing, then what, def what defines them and, and, and what distinguishes them from each other, of course? That's an important question that we also need to ask. Um, if we want to get towards a better definition of them, I think we might need to start with network structures, because ultimately, these are both about connecting and communicating with other people and receiving information via these connections, via, these, via this communication. So maybe that's a point where we might start to try and define these terms, echo chambers and filter bubbles. Um, so what I would propose with this is to distinguish them based on connectivity and communication. Um, we can define echo chambers by how people connect with each other. So that's, you know, friending people on Facebook, following people on Twitter, all of these sorts of functionalities where you connect with other users, with other people. And of course, that might be offline just as much as online. Um, so then the question is, for echo chambers, are, they, are we in these closed groups where we're just connected to others who've got the same political, ideological, whatever views as us? Or are we in multiple communities that overlap with each other where we might see a diversity of different views? And filter bubbles we could talk about in terms of communication. So independent of who we're connected with, who do we communicate with the most and, and most actively? Um, are we just communicating within our own little cliques, within our own little groups, um, where perhaps we've got lots of like-minded people um, who we most like to communicate with? Or do we talk across ideological or other interest lines? Do we communicate with people who have very different views to our own? So a very dodgy way of, of visualizing that is this. We're in echo chambers. We're all kind of connected within these groups that are themselves disconnected from each other, whereas in filter bubbles, we might be connected with all sorts of people, but we are only communicating within these uh, smaller networks um, with, of, of our closest, closest, perhaps, communicative acquaintances. So that's, and you've got that, I think, in the article I've given you as well. Um, that's sort of what I'd like to base uh, these definitions on, and again, it's not so much that my definitions are, are better than anyone else's, but in order to really test these, we've got to have definitions that are, in fact, testable. And that's what's been missing from much of the literature. So, <clears throat> to, and this is, sort of, this is the, the biggest chunk of text I'll, I'll give you in this lecture, but um, just to go through this, then the definition of an echo chamber is that it comes into being where a group of participants choose to preferentially connect with each other, follow each other, friend each other, blah, 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 um, to the exclusion of outsiders. And the more fully formed that kind of network of connection is, so the more that group is fully connected with each other and the more connections with people outside of that group are severed, are disconnected, the more isolated from the introduction of outside views that group is going to be, of course. While, of course, within that group, they can circulate their own views uh, very widely. By contrast, the filter bubble emerges when these people, independent of their structures of connection with others, choose to preferentially communicate with each other to the exclusion of outsiders. So where whoever they're connected with 
uh, in terms of who they follow, who they friend, if they choose just to talk to uh, a specific group of people with the same kinds of views. Um, and the more consistently they exercise that choice, the more likely it is that their own views and information will circulate amongst the members of this group rather than any information that's introduced from the outside. So two different uh, definitions, two different sides of the coin. Of course, they can, these two level, levels of connectivity and communication can overlap each other as well. You can both choose to connect only with a certain set of people and then also choose just to communicate with that set of people. But essentially, they're two different sides of the same coin. Um, and that's the distinction I'd make between echo chambers and filter bubbles. And at this point, this is agnostic about uh, whether this is the caused by algorithms or caused by our own, our own personal choices, or perhaps by a mix of both of them as well. So let's have a look at the evidence then. Do these things actually exist? If, we, if we're using these definitions, do they actually exist in, in the real world? Um, so I'm going to take you through a handful of, of, of studies. I've not picked them to push a particular agenda, but this is, I think, a reasonably representative example, uh, a set of examples. Early work, of course, on this started with the social media technologies of the day. And one of the most prominent and most, uh, most widely known early pieces of research actually focused on blogs, which were kind of the social media of the early 2000s and found what the uh, authors Lada Damage and Natalie Glantz called mild echo chambers, which is an interesting kind of term that we need to unpack a little bit as well. Um, what they found, and they looked at uh, networks of blogs uh, in, the 20, uh, in, a, in the 2004 US presidential election, um, they found essentially that Republican blogs linked more to other Republican blogs, Democrat blogs linked more to other Democrat blogs. Not incredibly surprising, obviously. More, more linking between blogs within the same ideological communities. But there was actually quite a bit of cross-linking there as well. So you see there the Republicans in, in red, the Democrats in blue. You see that orange kind of set of connections in between those two clusters. So that's what they called mild echo chambers. So a preferential connection um, between people of the same party, of the same ideology but still quite a bit of cross-linking going on. So if we're calling that mild echo chambers, it's, that's fair enough in a sense by saying that, yeah, they're not entirely disconnected from each other, but they're preferen preferentially connecting to each other, to, to their own people. But if that's the case, is that likely to produce the negative effects that the echo chamber theory says it will? Are people on either side of politics really not going to be informed about what the other side's thinking if there is still so much connection going on that these are only mild echo chambers? So yes, we can call that echo chambers, but it's unlikely to create the big problems in society and politics that um, the, the theory suggests it would. So if we have only mild echo chambers, is that in fact a problem? Or are we de then just back to a point where that's just what happens in politics, of course. Yes, people from one side of politics are going to talk more to each other um, than to the other side. Um, are we going, is, that, is that a problem in its own right? Should we worry in that case about echo chambers if, if they look like this? More recently, of course, work has moved more towards looking at current forms of social media, at Facebook, particularly at Twitter, partly simply because there's easier data access um, uh, on the Twitter side. Very often, the focus has been on hashtags, on keyword data sets as well. And here's one example of a study uh, that concluded in the end that there were both what they called open forums and echo chambers. So again, kind of a mixed result, essentially. Now, what they did here uh, was to look at a number of different hashtags um, related to, broadly, climate change. Um, the climate change hashtag itself um, is basically the hashtag for people who accept the scientific consensus on climate change. Global warming is the hashtag that is uh, a little bit more on the fence, That's uh, that way, where you've got debate between the two sides. And AGW, anthropogenic global warming, is a hashtag for people who, who deny the scientific consensus on climate change. So that's the logic, basically, of these three columns that you see there. What they then also did was to look at the follower networks of people who participate in those hashtags. So that's what I would call 
the echo chamber side, and then the retweet and the mention networks uh, on Twitter about uh, of of the people who participated in those, in those hashtags. So that's more on the filter bubble side, by my definition. And yeah, the, the results are quite diverse, as you can see, on the follower networks. Um, and you always see the people who accept the scientific consensus in green, the people who deny it in red. Um, you see, I guess, at the, so that's the top layer. You see quite a bit of polarization, clearly, between the different groups. The, uh, the people in green largely follow other people in green. The people in red largely follow other people in red. But there is still quite a bit of cross-connection going on. They're not s totally separated from each other. So again, from that perspective, you could perhaps borrow that term from a damage and glance and say these are mild echo chambers. They're preferentially connecting with their own people, but they're also not, uh, not disconnecting, uh, particularly from people on the other side. On the retweet network, you see something kind of similar. So there again, Climate change uh, 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 realists are retweeting each other. Climate change denialists are retweeting each other. That's not particularly surprising because you're probably not going to try and boost and amplify the views of someone who you don't agree with. So again, there you see perhaps what we could call mild filter bubbles in that case, um, where there is a lot more communication via retweeting between people on the same sides, although, again, they're not entirely disconnected from each other. And then when it comes to the mention networks at the bottom level, it's a free-for-all, and they're all kind of talking at and about and against each other all the time. So that's where perhaps the, this idea of the open forum comes in that the article also talks about. So there you see, particularly, in fact, in the AGW hashtag, they're just always fighting with each other, always interacting, always communicating with each other. So that's certainly not a filter bubble in anyone's uh, language. So if you put all of that together, though, and overlay it with each other, then there really is a question, well, is there any evidence here that these people are particularly disconnected from each other, either in the, in, in the way that they connect or in the way that they communicate with each other? Right? So what you're seeing here is, in fact, two very distinct sides of the debate, obviously, two very diver d different points of view, but they are particularly when it comes to mentions, constantly talking with and at and about uh, uh, each other. They're, they're shouting at each other, perhaps, but they're certainly communicating. So it's very unlikely that anyone who participates in any of these hashtags is not aware what the other side thinks. In fact, they're, they're all, all too aware what the other side thinks because they keep arguing against it all the time. So in that case, that's not going to produce the negative effects of echo chambers and filter bubbles that have been postulated. Because for that, you'd need to be unaware of what the other side thinks. These are not people who have built their own kind of reality around themselves saying climate change isn't real and have never heard the arguments of the other side. Right? So the question, in a sense, is can you actually have both open forums and echo chambers at the same time doesn't, does that even make sense, given what the people who say echo chambers are a real problem for us keep saying that they, they sort us into these different groups where we never see the other side's uh, perspectives? If you go back to the Barack Obama quote, these are not people who've retreated into their own bubbles where they never see anything that challenges their beliefs. They constantly see what challenges their beliefs. That's why they keep arguing with each other. So. That's not much evidence for the existence of echo chambers and filter bubbles. And again, I could have shown you many other uh, studies as well, but these are kind of useful examples. Beyond that, we also see studies that aren't based on network analysis, but on asking people about what they see in their networks. Um, here's a study from the Pew Center in the US. Uh, they never talk about the fact that this is about the US, but of course it is, um, from the 2016 US election, where they asked people what kind of views do you see on your social networks, on Twitter and Facebook? And most people said, well, they see a mix of beliefs, basically. They see both Republicans and Democrats. In fact, they, most people that they asked then went on to say, I really wish I didn't see so much of the other side. So Democrats were saying, I don't really want all of these MAGA people in my feed all the time, but there they are and I can't get rid of them. Republicans were saying, I don't want to see all these Hillary people in my feed all the time, but there they are, and I can't get rid of them. Literally, people were saying, I keep unfollowing and unfriending people, but I just keep seeing this stuff showing up in my feed, and it's really exhausting, and I don't want it anymore. 
So people were very actively, if anything, trying to put themselves into echo chambers and filter bubbles, but found it impossible to do so because there's just too many people in their network who've got diverse views, and perhaps the algorithm of the platforms themselves just kept feeding them views that didn't agree with their own. So people were exhausted, basically, by this constant polarizing struggle in the US uh, during that time and probably over the, the years after that as well. There's another study here from the Süddeutsche Zeitung in Germany um, in the 20, around the 2017 German federal election where they took a slightly different approach. They looked at um, the people who were um, following the pages of the major German parties, basically, and then looked at what those people who were following the pages of major German parties, what other pages they were also following. And what they found was that, yes, of course, some people follow particular parties and not others, but other than that, beyond that, they're all still following the same other kinds of things, the same media sources, um, the same uh, celebrities, the same sporting teams and sports people, and the same um, football clubs, of course, and the same, uh, the same comedians and so on as well. So um, broadly, this network is very well connected because people are still deeply interconnected with each other, even though they've got diverging political views. The only uh, exception from that is the far-right neo-fascist AFD party. Um, people who followed that party were basically only also liking pages that were um, you know, uh, expressing anti-immigration views, anti-Semitic views, whatever else. So that group is far more on the, on the political fringes and people who are um, fans of the AFD are not necessarily uh, as connected to mainstream culture, but even they're not entirely disconnected from it either. So that's, uh, again, a sign that the vast majority of the population is not, in fact, disconnected and in echo chambers and filter bubbles. Here's work that we did, uh, again, some years ago for the Australian Twitter sphere, which I think I might have shown you before, where um, we mapped the, the follower network um, in Australia uh, across nearly 4 million accounts. Um, and the structure of the Twitter sphere itself showed us that there aren't really many disconnections, if any, in the network that um, pretty much, you know, while there are clearly clusters that emerge around specific interests, these clusters are not disconnected from the rest of the network either. Um, even the progressives and the, and the people on the far right, or hard right as we called it then, were still quite well connected to particularly news and politics accounts as well. So again, there wasn't a sign that there was any kind of fundamental disconnection, um, except for some very specialty interests like the little porn cluster there, for instance. Um, so again, these kinds of studies, these larger scale studies, tend to show that there isn't evidence of echo chambers and filter bubbles. And then even people went back to this whole question of search, where the whole filter bubble thing started, um, and to some extent did this via uh, just recruiting a whole bunch of people with different political views and getting them to search for the same topics to see if they got different results. Sometimes they work with uh, fake accounts that they set up and trained to look to the search engine like Republicans or Democrats um, in the US um, and then got them to search for the same topics as well. And the results tend to look like this. This is from a piece by Nehrostein and Lewis where they found that the vast majority of news results being returned are from five or six key sources, New York Times, CNN, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, CNBC, Business Insider. Um, and they're pretty much mainstream, you know, middle of the road US uh, sources, some a little bit more liberal like the New York Times, some a bit more conservative like the Wall Street Journal, but not things like Breitbart or Fox News or other kind of uh, uh, more hyperpartisan outlets being recommended uh, to many people. Um, so what they concluded was, in fact, that there's almost too much uniformity, that people are just basically getting the same five sources for whatever they're searching for, and it would, it would actually be nice if there was more diversity in the search results. So if there is, if you like, from this a filter bubble, it encompasses the entirety of the United States, not particular communities or political views in the US. Everyone kind of gets the same sources recommended to them all the time when they search on, on Google, uh, Google News. The same has been repeated, by the way, for Germany and for other countries as well, and they found very different, uh, very similar results as well. 
and slightly different approach uh, that Algorithm Watch took in, the, uh, in, in Germany that we've repeated in Australia as well. Um, we're basically getting a whole bunch of people to install plugins on their browsers that regularly search for set terms. Uh, again, produces the very similar, uh, if not the same results over and over again for the same search terms, even though you've got a very broad range. They had, I think, 1,500 people who'd installed the, the browser plugin from very different walks of life, very different ideologies. Mostly people get the same search results if they search for the same topics, sometimes even in exactly the same order on the page, on the results page. So there again, we're not seeing any evidence that there is uh, uh, any diversity in search results. Um, very different to that anecdote that Parisa starts with, where he asks two friends and they have different results. You know, if he asked today, they probably would have exactly the same results. So why is that? Why do we not see evidence for echo chambers and filter bubbles when we actually do empirical work, when we try and test these ideas? Um, well, the first thing is that often the smaller scale studies and anecdotal studies just start from very basic and very, very small data sets. And we need to really see the big picture. Yes, if you're looking at a, a, a Twitter hashtag like MAGA, you're probably going to find a lot of Donald, Donald Trump supporters. If you look at a, a Twitter hashtag like Hillary or whatever back in the day, then you'd probably find a lot of Hillary Clinton supporters. That's not surprising. That's what they're there for, literally. Um, but of course, people aren't just on Twitter in these hashtags. In the case of Twitter, and the same is true for other platforms, um, they are operating right across the entire platform and across multiple platforms at that. So just because you're in a MAGA hashtag and you're saying Trump, 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 um, doesn't mean that you're not elsewhere on Twitter seeing views that do not agree with your own, that are not pro-Trump. Just because you're on Facebook and you've, you're, you're following a page that's, uh, that's a pro-Hillary Clinton page or whatever, doesn't mean that in your personal networks you're not actually getting people talking about Donald Trump and, and saying how great he is. Um, so by looking at just at very small parts of the overall network infrastructure, um, we are ultimately uh, misleading ourselves. We need to see the much bigger picture of, of the full platform, in fact, of multiple platforms. Um, also, and this is something that we've talked about some weeks ago, of course, everyone shares news online, uh, at, at least occasionally, and in everyday context in non-political context. So there's a lot of news that just spreads across social media serendipitously. Um, and of course, that's being spread by people from all sorts of walks of life, all sorts of ideologies in people's personal networks. Everyone's got that weird uncle who keeps sharing far right or far, far left kind of news items from time to time. Um, that's not an unusual experience. So we're getting a lot of stuff that does not agree with our own political views simply because we are in diverse networks. That's the one thing. The second thing is that just because we attach to communities that we might have some interest in, whether that's political or, or, or some other interest, doesn't mean that we're automatically disconnecting from everything else. So this, this is not a zero-sum game. This is not communicating tubes. Just because you connect to something that you really like doesn't mean that you're really very actively going out of your way to disconnect from everything else that you're not that interested in. We seek, but we don't evade conflict. Another way of saying this is that homo homophily, so l connecting with like-minded others, doesn't mean that you're actively disconnecting from people who've got different views from your own, unless they're really obnoxious or really annoying, of course. So much of what's being called echo chambers in the literature tends to be just communities of interest. Yes, people are connecting to communities that interest them, of course, everyone does, but it doesn't mean that you're actively running away from everything that disagrees with you. So we can't generalize all of these case studies that we keep seeing. Um, it's almost impossible, and I say almost impossible, to, connect, to, to avoid connections that go across ideologies. Um, Facebook pages, Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, and so on, in part, these are engines of homophily. Yes, you, you join perhaps a Facebook group, a Facebook page, a WhatsApp page, you join whatever other communities you can find online because you think, ah, well, there are people like me, people who like the same music, who like the same movies, who've got the same ideology, who've, who are interested in the same, same uh, 
issues or whatever, yes, that's why you're joining these spaces. And you will find people who've got similar views there. That's what they're for. But your Facebook profiles particularly are places where you find quite diverse communities. There's your family, your friends, your s people who you went to school with, people who you work with, people who you do play sports with, whatever else. Occasional random people who, who you've just friended because you, you ran into them in the pub. You know, all of these sorts of connections are there. And that's very diverse in terms of interests as well as ideologies. And this is, I think, one of the big mistakes that a lot of the people who advocate for echo chambers and filterables who say that they exist make. We don't tend to connect. I think that's hopefully true for most of you as well. When we connect online, we, when we connect via social media, we don't actually tend to connect based on political ideology. I'm not going to connect with you and say, well, what, what's your political ideology? If it's not the same as mine, I'm not going to connect with you. Um, that doesn't normally happen. But that's what people like Parisa and, and, and Sunstein assume happens. Perhaps because they themselves have a much stronger kind of political ideology. So Parisa says, we connect with our political compadres. And I don't think that's really true. Yeah, on some platforms, this is actually one of the points I'm, I'm going to get to in a second. On some platforms, yes, that might happen. Um, so, but not so much on generic broad social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so on. I think. It is possible, and that's really the point that, that, that you're asking about, it is possible to create hard echo chambers, to create hard filter bubbles where you're really disconnecting from everyone who doesn't hold your own personal views, but it's almost like joining a cult. Um, and sorry, the examples I use may, may or may not offend people. It's a bit like joining Jehovah's Witnesses or Scientology or something that requires you to disconnect from everyone who's not part of that group. It's not part of that cult. Um, so yes, you can do that. You can go to that, that point where you say, if you are not part of the same kind of whatever, Q or non-conspiracy group that I'm part of, then I'm disconnecting from you. Some people actually do that. And there are some platforms that make that easier. So I'm, I'm not even so much thinking of Telegram, but things like 4chan, 8chan, Gab, Parler, and so on. These really specific platforms that have been created, particularly for QAnon, for the far right, uh, particularly in the US. Um, so yes, if you're, if you're there and if you're, if you're just using those platforms, then maybe you can con disconnect to an extent from people who've got very different views from your own. Um, but at the same time, the people who are most likely to use those sorts of platforms, we've seen in the research, are also very often very heavy users of mainstream news, of mainstream platforms. And that's because they may not like the mainstream news, they may not like the mainstream platforms, but they need to, they need to know what the other side's thinking. So there's some older studies that, that look at, uh, you know, very well-established far-right communities, for instance, white supremacist communities. And people who are in these communities are very active readers of things like the New York Times because they need to know what the enemy is thinking and they need to be, know how to argue back against it as well. Um, they need to maybe embed what the mainstream media is reporting into their own conspiracy theories. And again, we're seeing that a lot with the sort of QAnon groups as well. They're very actively looking across the mainstream media for hidden signs that their conspiracy theory is correct. They're not ignoring mainstream media at all. They're very actively scouring mainstream media for any sign that, that they can interpret as a hidden sign from Q himself or whoever that uh, the, the great sort of change is coming, basically. So, um, so yes, in principle, it is, it is possible, of course, to disconnect from the rest of the world and just operate within your own little bubble or echo chamber but it is very, very difficult to do that. So the broader kind of echo chamber and, and filter bubble argument tends to be very techno-determinist, very much saying it's all technology's fault. Uh, since we've had social media, everything's falling apart. Um, and I think that's quite self-serving and, and really ultimately misleading. Um, we as people are very complicated, <laughs> if you haven't noticed. Um, we have very diverse interests that sometimes are very contradictory and inconsistent. Um, these interests are complex. Politics, for most people, is a really tiny part of what they're interested in. 
might be slightly different in this room, might be slightly different for, for us generally in media and communication studies, but um, vastly across the population overall, people mostly just don't care about politics, and that's maybe not a bad thing. Um, and the algorithms of these platforms that need to try and understand who we are and what we want and what we're interested in actually still have a very hard time working that out because we are so diverse and so, so inconsistent and contradictory in ourselves. Um, so the platforms themselves cannot very easily put us in these ideological bubbles. Um, plus, of course, we have this kind of random serendipity that happens on these platforms. And of course, mainstream media haven't gone away either. So that's still part of our, our information diet as well, even if we're no longer um, so actively perhaps watching the TV news or buying newspapers or whatever. But um, they, they, haven't, they haven't fallen out of the system entirely. So if you put all of that together, most people actually still have a very mixed information diet. They at least receive information from a very broad mix of sources. What they then do with it is another question, of course. So in many ways, these echo chamber filter level um, debates tend to be very much moral panics, in the same way that we've had moral panics around the internet and around the web and around games and around, you know, electronic devices and mobile devices and so on, and how they would wreck society. This is what happens always when some new technologies come along, basically. Uh, we've kept overestimating the power of AI as well and algorithms. Um, Negroponte, as I've said, wrote about the Daily Me in 1995. It still hasn't happened. We still don't have a personalized newspaper um, uh, in the way that he described it. We still don't have flying cars, if you want to go that far either, of course. And that's been around since the 1970s or so. Um, so in some ways, this is really very much a myth. And I like this quote from David Weinberger, who said this in 2004, so you know, nearly 20 years ago, that the echo chamber was a myth that's waiting to concretize into common wisdom. And by now, it has become that sort of common sense idea that, yes, of course, echo chambers exist. Don't we know it? We see QAnon, so they must exist. But the evidence just doesn't bear that out, unfortunately. It is very handy, though, for shifting blame, for blaming social media, for attacking social media platforms. And I don't, don't really, please don't get me wrong, there's a lot of reasons that we can attack and criticize social media platforms, but echo chambers and filter bubbles are really the least of those problems. Hate speech, abuse, trolling, misinformation, disinformation, all of these are very good reasons to be very critical of social media platforms. Echo chambers and filter rules are not uh, fundamental. So I like this from an article from a little while ago from Vice in Germany saying that the, f the, the filter bubble is the dumbest metaphor on the internet. I think that's actually quite true. And ultimately it distracts us as well. It distracts us from the much more fundamental changes, uh, fundamental challenges that we need to confront you know, QAnon exists, and other communities like that exist. They don't exist because they only see Q content. They encounter a very diverse range of content. The question is what they do with that content. The question is why, when they see an article from the New York Times saying Donald Trump has lost the election, they immediately say, well, that's coming from the New York Times, so you can't believe it because, and, and, and fall into this whole conspiracy theory argument. What's going on there? That, I think, is the interesting question. They do see this content. They just react to it in a very different way that you and I might react to it. Not, not, no offense if any, anyone here is a QAnon fan, maybe. Um, so the problem really is ultimately what, what's going on there. And the problem, again, and I think I showed these images last time, but just to, to kind of say this again, the metaphor, the vision, the image, when we talk about the echo chamber, for a lot of people, kind of tends to look like this. We've just got that single feed of information that comes to us. We're isolated from everyone else, so we're very directly and deeply influenced by the information that comes in. Um, and we have no one else to talk to, basically, to work out if that information is true. So that seems to be the sort of the core metaphor of, of, uh, of the echo chamber, of the filter bubble. The problem is just that's really not people's reality. People's reality looks a lot more like this very complex, multi-sourced, all of these different options, all of these different choices, all of this different information floating around everywhere, and we're standing in front of it trying to make sense of it all, um, trying to work out what to, what to follow, who to follow, who to connect with, who to communicate with, what to believe, uh, 
what to take, re uh, take, take seriously, what to laugh about. Um, and that's becoming more and more complex because we are so hyper-connected and we've got so many different sources of information and it's not always clear how reliable, how authoritative they are, um, whether they are proper journalism, for instance, or just someone with a blog. So this is the challenge, I think, that we actually face much more than being disconnected. The problem is hyper-connectivity, not disconnection, ultimately. And this, I don't know if I've showed this to you before, but this to me is a really good example. This image is from a, from a protest against lockdowns and vaccines and everything else in, in Melbourne um, uh, in 2020. And, you know, just look at it. All the stuff that's on there. It starts at the top there with the QAnon slogan, where we go one, we go all. Sheeple, educate yourself, QAnon, pandemic, MCultra, Epstein Island, Clinton emails, Great Awakening, Ritual Child Sacrifice, why not? Um, false Flag, Geoengineering, Illuminati, Vril Society, End the Fed, Adenochrome, Tesla Free Energy, operating, or, Operation Paperclip, Spirit Cooking, 5G, PsyOps, Vaccines, Mockingbird Media, Lucifer Telescope. I mean, you'd have to look quite hard to find additional conspiracy theories to add to this, I think. It covers them pretty well. And this is not a person who is in an echo chamber or a filter bubble. This is someone who's too connected to everything else, who's done her own research, certainly, who's kind of looked for everything in all the wrong places and somehow turned this into some sort of worldview um, that, uh, that she's now protesting about, basically. So this is not someone, again, this is not someone who's disconnected from the world, who's got no access to information. This is someone who's got all the information available to them and doesn't really know how to protest, process that, what to do with it, where to draw the line, what, what's wrong and what's, what's true anymore, basically. So that, to me, is much more of the problem than being disconnected uh, because we're in echo chambers and filter bubbles. Now, I, I want to not say that... I, I want to be clear. I, I'm not saying that connection itself is a problem. That would, again, be... Uh, technological determinism saying it, it, things were better when we weren't so connected. That's not true because conne connection technologies like the internet overall, like the web, like social media, are also really incredibly important for personal and social support. They enable people to find like-minded others that they might not find in their local area, in their local neighborhood. So being connected via technology via social media can be incredibly empowering and incredibly useful. And we've seen that too with a lot of recent developments, whether it is LGBTIQ communities finding each other and supporting each other, whether it is Me Too or Black Lives Matter or whatever. These are cases where connectivity has been incredibly useful for people to band together, to join together and to organize. But in this particular case, that kind of connectivity has gone the other way and has enabled people to you know, to just find all sorts of stuff, regardless of, of whether it's true or not, and, and, and feed that into some sort of very strange, uh, hyper-connected worldview. So, and again, this is the example of, and that's been going, sorry, it's been going on for quite a long time as well. Um, this is from 2011, a study that looked at Stormfront, which is a white supremacist uh, site that's been, that's been in existence for decades. Um, and they found that people who were active on that white supremacist side were twice as likely to visit the New York Times as well compared to more ordinary people who just visited Yahoo News. So again, these people are not disconnected. They're not disconnected from the mainstream. They're paying very close attention to the mainstream in order both to find out what the mainstream are saying about them, but also how to counter the arguments in the mainstream and find ways to, from their position, debunk mainstream points of view. So this has been going on for a very long time as well. And again, that's not echo chambers, it's not filter bubbles, it's connectivity in this particular case. So again, going back to David Weinberger, um, who said, said yeah, nearly 20 years ago, the problem with an extraterrestrial conspiracy mailing list isn't that there's an echo chamber, it thinks that it, it's that it thinks there's a conspiracy by the extraterrestrials. That's really the problem. Uh, it's not the structure of it, it's, it's the views themselves that are the problem. We might now say that the problem is not that there are hyperpartisan echo chambers or filter bubbles, because there really aren't. It's that there are hyperpartisan fringe groups that fundamentally reject and actively find 
despite any mainstream societal and democratic consensus, which they are very well aware of, but simply don't like, simply oppose. So the problem ultimately is political polarization. It's not a fragmentation of our connections and communication. And that's really, I think, what echo chamber filter bubble arguments keep distracting us from. They keep blaming technology. They keep trying to find technological solutions when, in fact, the more fundamental problem is the filter in our heads or in people's heads, at least, who are in these kinds of communities that have disconnected their worldviews but not their communicative activities from the, uh, the mainstream consensus. In some countries, obviously, more than others. Um, but this is a trend, perhaps, that is going on in many countries around the world as well. So what we need to get to, I think, is a much better understanding of how polarization works, of hi how hi hyperpartisanship works, um, rather than uh, trying to fix things that don't exist, like echo chambers and filter bubbles. And polarization does exist. This is, again, most of these studies are unfortunately from the US and are often very simplistically just measuring, I guess, the, the distinctions between the Re Republicans and Democrats. Uh, but this is from the Pew Center, from a survey that they did and have done for, again, what is that, nearly 30 years now, um, where it shows that from the sort of mid-2010s or so onwards, the sort of median positions of Republicans and Democrats have moved quite far apart when before they were actually still fairly close together. Um, so ideological division, polarization, um, seems to be increasing, at least in the US. We don't really have good data like this for other countries, partly because many other countries don't have a simple bipolar system like the US does, but have multi-party multi systems, of course, where you couldn't quite measure this in the same way. Um, but this is, this is happening. So why is it happening? And if this is seen as a bad thing, which I think arguably in the US it is, how do we deal with that? So what's this filter in our heads, maybe in their heads? How do we assess, ultimately, these levels of polarization? Um, how does that work over time? You know, is it getting, getting worse? Is it getting better? Um, how is it different across countries? Maybe because different countries have different political systems, maybe different media systems, different cultural, historical attitudes as well. Um, how do we assess this between different groups? How, how does it work maybe also on different platforms? Is the debate on Twitter more polarized than it is on Facebook, than it is on Instagram, than it is on TikTok? Um, these are all things that need to be addressed and, and understood much more. Um, more recently, too, we've kind of moved away from just talking about ideological or party political polarization um, towards an, a, a greater understanding of different forms of polarization as well. So particularly in the US, we might be moving away from a polarization that's based on political ideologies, issues, and is much more based on identity. So it doesn't really matter what the Republican or the Democrat Party stand for. It's simply that you say, I'm a Republican, or I'm a Democrat, and therefore I hate the other side. So that's, that's a much more identity-based, much more effective, emotional form of polarization that's really about who you are, not actually what you stand for anymore or what your party stands for. And that's a problem also because those kinds of polarizations are much harder to overcome than polarization based on policy, based on certain issues, where you can perhaps still find a consensus. If people disagree on a particular point of policy, maybe they can find a middle ground that they can both live with. If they disagree on identity, then that's not really easy to reconcile. You can't say, well, you're a Republican, I'm a Democrat, how do we meet in the middle in our identity? Um, that's, a, that's much harder to, to, to get away from again. So this is starting to be recognized much more that there might be different forms of polarization, some easier to resolve than others. Um, and of course, when this really goes way down the s to the sides into very deep hyper-partisanship, um, wh what's the process through which that happens? What's the process th through which people don't just become Republicans, but MAGA Republicans, 
far-right Trump followers who start to attack the capital and want to overthrow the government. What, how does that happen? How can that be counteracted and reversed again as well, of course? Um, when they are in that, in that stage, in that position, how does that change the way that they process information that, that goes against their worldview? That's again that kind of question of the filter in our heads. You know, if people who believe Donald Trump is still US president see all the evidence that he isn't, why don't they accept that? What's the process that's going on in their heads that makes them still reject all of that? You could say the same thing about climate change. You could say the same thing about all sorts of other topics as well, where there are hyperpartisans who are just simply not going to be uh, changing their minds because of uh, you know, reasoned arguments, because of evidence that's being presented to them. In fact, if you present them with evidence, they're probably just going to say, well, you're obviously liberal, so you're trying to confuse me, or you're, trying to, to, you're lying to me, or whatever, so um, I, uh, I reject your, your views fundamentally. So how do you deal with people who've gone so far down into that uh, fringe worldview? And often, of course, the people who are very deep into these fringe worldviews are also then engaged in sharing myths or active disinformation in con conspiracy theories, in trolling and abusing people who, who they see as their enemies. So what's going on there? And again, what can be done about it to reduce that, uh, the, 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 the extent to which that is happening? So that's really about combating polarization, hyperpartisanship. How do we protect societies from this? If we agree, which I, I guess, I hope we do, that this kind of hyperpartisanship is, is destructive, is damaging for society, how do we protect society from it? Um, how do you de-radicalize ultimately people who are really far off into these into these uh, spaces? Um, and I'm really saying de-radicalization here quite deliberately because it's not, I think, at that point a question of arguing with them anymore, of trying to convince them of the other side by giving them other evidence. But it is very much a long-term process of de-radicalization in the same way that uh, you deal with, um, you know, uh, religious fundamentalists in the same way that you deal with uh, with terrorists and other e extremists as well. Ultimately, um, because people are so deeply set in their minds that simply giving them other evidence is not going to change their minds. Um, of course, at, at the center of society, if mis and disinformation circulates, and we've talked about this over the last few weeks as well, how do you counter that? How do you neutralize that? Um, we've talked about the role of fact-checking, of course, a couple of weeks ago, and that's useful, but only goes so far. Um, we've talked about the process by which fake news, mis disinformation it circulates. What do you do about that? These are all really fundamental questions that still need to be addressed much more. And ultimately, some of this might also be about digital media literacy, about increasing ordinary people's resilience and resistance against mis- and disinformation, against populism and propaganda uh, as well, about, against people who are trying to pull them towards these hyper-partisan sides um, by perhaps serving them information that's problematic in some form. Now, digital media literacy is in itself not unproblematic because while and I'm assuming that all of us are somewhere broadly in the mainstream of society. While we might all agree that certain sources of hyperpartisan information are not to be trusted because they're clearly coming from a very extreme kind of point of view, um, and I'm just going to say Fox News or Breitbart, or so we might perhaps all agree that, well, you know where they're coming from, you know what they are, so take whatever they say uh, very cautiously um, and don't just accept it blindly. But people who are on the very fringes of the political spectrum basically use the same arguments. They just have a very different coordinate system. They might say, well, you know that it's coming from the New York Times or from the Washington Post, so you can't trust it because they're all liberal lefties and so on, and, and that therefore you can't trust it. So they, too, use media literacy um, mechanisms just with a very different system of coordinates, with a very different understanding of what to trust and what not to trust. So media literacy in its, in, in its own right, the tools of media literacy 
checking your sources, understanding the background uh, from which something has been produced and so on, the tools themselves are not actually enough to inoculate people against mis- and disinformation because those tools can also be used by the hyperpartisans themselves and are being used by the hyperpartisans themselves to attack mainstream news outlets and mainstream information, mainstream information sources. So there's, a, there's something more that needs to be done to prevent the abuse of media literacy by the hyperpartisans, by people who are on the extreme ends of the political spectrum. All right. That's, I think, where we're leaving it for today on that happy note. Sorry. Um, uh, there's a lot more work to be done, obviously, in all of this, as you can see, but um, it is an important area to keep working on as well. Um, so having talked about echo chambers and filter bubbles, as I've said, and gone through this, uh, this whole debate about whether they're real or not, um, and having really said, I guess, that, well, the platforms can be blamed for a lot of things, but actually not so much for that, next week we're going to look at the platforms themselves and the often very problematic interplay, especially that they've had with news and information providers, news outlets and so on. Um, and for that I've given you an article from colleagues of mine in Australia, uh, uh, James Mees and Eddie Herkham, um, that talks through essentially that really difficult and changing relationship, particularly be between Facebook and the news media. Um, and the way that the, uh, the news media ultimately depend to a certain extent on Facebook and other social media platforms. This is not just about Facebook. Um, so the way that they depend f on these platforms for visibility, for reaching an audience, but also the way that that dependence, of course, comes at a price because how Facebook and these other platforms operate can change practically overnight and has at times. And in a sense, as you're reading that, even though it's about Facebook, maybe also think about the current things happening on Twitter again, because there too, since Elon Musk has bought up the place and is making up policy as he goes along, basically, based on, on, on whims and kind of uh, you know, opinion polls that he's running on Twitter, there too, things are changing very, very quickly, probably not for the better. And of course, the news publishers and everyone else who's using Twitter also needs to adjust to that and try and work out how to still operate in that environment, which is now being flooded again by bots and trolls and uh, hyperpartisans as well, in fact. So, um, so yeah, next, next time we're really looking at the power of the platforms themselves. And uh, I'll talk a bit about a particular case uh, beyond this, this particular article uh, that we've seen in Australia recently that really illustrates the power particularly of Facebook over the way that news is, dis is distributed on its platform.